Someone left a comment on my Rocky video asking how to improve top speed when I specifically said do not leave sprint questions on my Rocky videos. But it's a good question. So. What is top speed? It's the fastest speed that your body is capable of producing when sprinting. It's redlining. Now, the fastest a man has ever been recorded running is 60 miles an hour. Faster. But, well, this is questionable because he did it in a set of performance enhancing blue Adidas gym shoes. But now, well, the speed's plummeted to a paltry 27.8 miles per hour because at the world, they force you to wear your shorts and those damn sponsors make you wear their overpriced spikes. Rules. Now, top speed is not a length of time. That would be top speed maintenance. Top speed is the moment in a race when you reach your maximal velocity. But what is that though? It's the time when you've produced the best push off the floor at a 45 degree angle in a horizontal direction. As soon as you leave the floor, you're decelerating again. So while top speed might feel like you're flying, by the time you feel it, you're already slowing down. Top speed is that moment from the foot hitting the floor from that knee flex position, riding over the center of mass and then ripping out the back again. That's your peak velocity. Basically, it's one stride. But we don't measure it in one stride. You see, limitations in modern technology mean that most people are measuring it over a 10 meter segment, and that's more like four to five strides. Now, you can see why it's done this way, but can you also see how if you got two amazing strides out of five and three less amazing ones, from the clock's perspective, it wouldn't register a great velocity, even though from a biomechanical perspective, you got it very, very right twice. And that just means that the digits that you get on the clock when you're doing your top speed sessions just aren't always that helpful. Here's some quick math to illustrate. You run 10 meters in one second, therefore 10 meters a second, and it takes you five strides. Now, if they're all even, that means that each step took you 0.2 seconds. Now, just imagine that you got it amazingly right for three strides, but you floundered on two. So, okay, you did a 0.25, but then a smoking 0.18, followed by a scorching 0.17, and then a blistering 0.16. And the wheels came off, the last stride was a 0.24. It adds up to the same one second, but you showed a glimpse of greatness with that 0.16 second hop. Now imagine, you've just had that feeling like you've been Touched by Hermes himself, you conquered a new level of speed, and so you jog over enthusiastically to your coach, who nonchalantly tells you... One second. Same as before. That glimpse of what it felt like to run faster is destroyed by the cold, hard, objective truth. Now, you then offer the line... Not faster. And coach replies... Huh. Now this watch, it runs on batteries, not your emotions. These digits don't lie. I don't want you to tell you. Come back and do it again. Millennials in your feelings. And you do go back, shaking your head. And your next thought is very revealing. Now, do you consider... Nah, it's definitely faster. I probably just timed it wrong. Or, he's trying to play mind games with me. Clever. He wants to see if I go even faster still. Right, now I'm going to unleash the beast. The best gets timed right this time. Or, I don't know how to run any faster, because when I feel like I do, obviously I'm not. It's just a waste of time. Maybe I just don't have it. These issues with the hops, the timing of said hops, and the psychology of how you receive that news, I think is why athletes find it difficult to improve their top speed. But this could all be boiled down to a technology issue. Yeah. Just imagine if I could get a peak velocity figure. Yeah, it'd be nice. But the wind would affect it. Okay. What about a peak wattage from the floor reading? Now that would be perfect. But 
No one's clamouring to put a strain gauge in a shoe and revolutionise running training. They got men back from the moon using two used bog rolls and some gaffer tape. They can't put a little old strain gauge in a shoe? It's a government conspiracy. They want to keep everybody slow. Slow people are easy to arrest. Yep. Plus, there's only like 43 sprinters in the world, so there's no money in it. So, with limited tech, instead, athletes start believing that there are secret sessions that make you faster, and are then shocked to find out that the fastest people in the world are doing the same sessions that they're doing. The only difference is, they get faster doing them. You see, top speed training is the training to increase the force you produce when your foot hits the floor, increase the speed you can apply that force that you produce, improve the angle of trajectory at the moment your foot leaves the ground. Sorry to kill the mystery, but that's it. After this, you're just floating, and then trying to control the crash back to Earth. The force that you produce when your foot hits the floor is determined by the hip extension force that your body can produce from a bent knee. Now, force is strength, so the weights room would seem like the best place to build that attribute, right? Wrong. The weights room sucks for building top speed. It's useless. In fact, it's worse than useless. It's counterproductive. Even if you could mimic the movement, the weight that people would consider to be weight would be resistance and that would slow you down. Slowing down defeats the purpose of top speed. And at the light weights that you'd have to use in order to not slow down the movement, you'd be thinking, well, I can't feel this. And so you start adding more weight again, which goes back to that defeating the purpose of top speed thing. So how are you going to increase force without using weight? How are you going to increase tension without using a bar or dumbbell? In fact, is it even conceivable to increase strength without using some metal plate wrapped in rubber? One word. Four letters, rhyming with hello. Strong, without weights. Oh, snow! <laughs> Judo! <laughs> Blow. Hell no, bozo. Plyo. If you learn how to do plyo correctly, you will learn how to increase your top speed. You'll want to do both explosive and reactive plyo unilaterally and alternating. Unilaterally just means all left and then all right. Alternating means left, right, left, right, left, right. Explosive just means that you're focusing on producing maximum force. Now, don't worry, because you're doing this at body weight, producing maximum force is going to make you do it quickly. Just try jumping as high as you can. You're not going to do that slowly. Reactive just means that you're trying to do it as quickly as possible. An easy way to visualize this would be if you're trying to do 10 hops for distance, that would be explosive plyo because you're trying to get the furthest with each hop. But if you timed how fast you did your 10 hops, and you'd have to set the distance for each hop, otherwise people start cheating and go from like boom, boom, boom to da -da 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 -da, I win. Then the faster that you can do those 10 hops, the more reactive you are. Caveat. Ignore at your peril. How you do something is so much more important than just doing something. If you're a couch surfer, then yeah, doing something's a good start. You can be inspired by the logo of a commercial sports company. But let me assure you, if you are already doing it, then just doing it more or badly is not going to get you to the front cover of the magazine. Well, not unless it's Sport Illustrated, the injury issue. So that covers force. Next thing is the speed that you can apply that force. If you want to increase the speed of applying force in a very short time, you need to train a way that is going to reduce the amount of time that you've got to work with. If you've got less time to apply that same force, then you're creating a stimulus that your nervous system can adapt to. Now, I'm going to say something that's a little bit controversial here, as in studies may not back this up, but I found the best way to do this is something called overspeed, or what I call cadence rope. When you know how to sprint and you replicate that form exactly while being pulled by an elastic cord, you'll have less time on the floor. This means you give yourself the chance to apply the same force in less time. But again, hear me now. Don't focus on the thing, the gadget 
the gizmo. I keep seeing comments and hearing athletes focusing on contraptions, like training is just about buying stuff on Amazon. Damn straight. Pay at checkout, use product purchased, become a better athlete, 30 days, money back guaranteed. But most times this doesn't work, and there's a reason. You see, the body is a slippery son of a parent's DNA. It's an adaptation, but it's also a compensation machine. So people buy the rope, they use the rope, and yet they don't run it like a scientific experiment. They don't do the control run without the rope, and then when they use the rope, they don't make sure that run is exactly the same as the control run. They run with the rope, but they want to change the way they run. They let the rope pull them, they're thinking about not tripping, they're thinking do they look funny, they're leaning back on the rope rather than leaning forward into it, etc. They then don't graduate the pulls, trying to progress them to be more and more intense over time. They don't understand the recovery. The list goes on. Then, after a few weeks, nothing much has improved. In fact, the sprinting might even have got worse. Because what you practice is what you produce, and they practice rubbish running with a head full of nonsense. And then they say, oh, the cane's rope doesn't work. So, this will only work if you know what you're doing. Now, the final part is just improving the angle of trajectory. And at least, this one's a bit simpler. It just means improving the flexibility and mobility of your hip flexors so you can get a more optimal push off the floor. Now, if you're a person who's already got gymnastic level abilities in your sprinter splits, then that's already optimized. But if not, doing this is going to help. But you do have to then take that improvement in end range and translate that into improvement in functional range. Now, if you improve one and two, but not three, then effectively you'll be better off the ground and you'll create more vertical airtime, but you won't improve your top speed. And this is because you'll have increased vertical velocity, but not horizontal velocity. Basically, you're going to be jumping up and down higher, not moving forward faster. And here's the last piece of advice for a person on a budget. If you don't have the money to buy gadgets or access to equipment like ropes, parachutes, sleds, high-speed treadmills, timing gates, all manner of other kind of doohickeys and paraphernalia, here's a cheap version. Race cars or a buddy on a bike. Let them start behind you and before you, and as they come past you and try to overtake you, just try to not get overtooken. Tell them to go roughly at your top speed, maybe just a smidgen quicker, and just enjoy racing and chasing. If you have fun with it, you'll get faster. Okay, so if I use a cadence rope on a high-speed treadmill while pulling a sled, I'm gonna get faster, right? I can find myself an eBay auction, buy myself some leg weighted tights. <laughs> I hope this helps. If it did, press the virtual Polex, because let me tell you something. Makes me feel good. And do me a favor, give that bell hell. Have your say in the comments, bae. And if you like my vibe, please subscribe.